Hello and welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I am the host of this show. We're live every Monday night at eight o'clock Eastern with the exception of a few holidays. And this week we're coming back with one of those, those types of episodes that we get a lot of requests for. And uh, it's actually fairly new for the live stream. And that's the Ask the Salt Strong Coaches show. And this week we are, I'm going to bring them on screen right now. We are joined by two of our salt strong coaches we have pat ogletree and justin ritchie and and i was joking beforehand That's backstage gone. with justin i don't know if he's a coach if he's a tackle guy if he's whatever he is he's a superhero in the background the guy knows everything um so i wanted to have you know the the regular ask the coaches show and just so that people understand who everybody is and what we can cover for those that aren't familiar with me, my name is Rich Natoli. I am a salt strong fishing coach. I cover the mid Atlantic. So anything from Maryland up to Maine, salt water, that's my area. Uh, that's what I cover. So I, I fish multi species, inshore, offshore, all that good stuff. And then we have Pat Ogletree. Pat, you want to talk about your area that you're typically uh, fishing at any given time? Yeah, I'm actually uh, a traveling fishing coach. So home for me is uh, East Central Florida. So uh, the Indian River Mosquito Lagoon is home, but uh, I live in an RV full time. So I travel everywhere from South Texas all the way up to Virginia and all points in between. So I've seen a lot of different situations and, and fished a lot of different ways. So uh, I'm definitely blessed to be able to do that. Great. And so we have a lot of a lot of territory covered already. And then let's bring in Justin. So Justin Ritchie, first of all, welcome to your first time on the stream. And uh, why don't you let people know a little bit about your fishing background and, and so on. Thank you, man. Um, <clears throat> well, first off, this is cool to be on. This is it's kind of reminiscent of for any of the people that are watching that are insider members. We used to do like an inner circle call every week. That was really cool. We'd have a theme topic and we'd, you know, ask a bunch of questions, hear questions from our members and we answer the questions for the most part, but go off on a tangent too. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so I am the head of tackle at salt strong. Uh, I'm am was also kind of like a, a coach as well. Um, for those of you that know me, no, I, I have a beautiful four month old daughter. So figuring out the balance between being a daddy and being a coach can be a little, a little tough, but, uh, I do all the purchasing for, uh, all the fishing tackle in our online shop, fishstrong.com. And uh, I'm a bit of a tackle dork, so I, I am obsessed, obsessed with rods, rod construction. Uh, love to answer and talk about questions on rod and reel pairing, the inner working details of uh, what makes a reel tick. Granted, I'm not personally an engineer, but I've pulled down a couple reels myself and uh, have know how to put them together and know how not to put them together, so I can help you prevent uh, from making those mistakes. Um, but for fishing. I, I guess I'm not a traveling coach like Pat. I, I live in Orlando, so I, the majority of my fishing is central east and central west coast of Florida, Mosquito Lagoon or, or Tampa Bay. Um, but I have traveled quite a bit. I do a lot of offshore kayak fishing too. So I, for a long time, for many years, my, my goal was to try to see how many different species I can catch from a kayak. Um, sailfish, tuna, kingfish, wahoo. Uh, mutton snapper, lots of offshore species crossed off, all the inshore species crossed off. I've even fished in Amsterdam. I competed in the Hobie World Championship in 2014 and uh, had a chance to go over and represent the U.S. in that tournament. So I've I've traveled a little bit and fished for weird stuff, like weird stuff to me. <laughs> in yeah, yeah. 80 feet of water, fishing for perch that are like 25 inches long, very different. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's my short TED talk, I guess. We'll, we'll jump into tackle stuff later yeah i'm sure we're gonna have some questions on tackle so uh you know the one thing that was mentioned i think pat you had mentioned it the, the fishing season never ends in florida it just goes year round we have kind of like a lull in the mid-atlantic and northeast where people are still out fishing i mean i'm still going out every week where it's safe to get on the water and i know a lot of other people that are also doing that but a lot of people take this time even if they're still out on the water to kind of take care of their gear and get ready for the spring season to open up again. And I would say really the, the main fishing time up in this area is depending on where you are in the region is going to be anywhere from March 1st through maybe mid January. And then people kind of slow down for a little bit. So it's tackle time, right? It's time to take care of tackle. It's time to, to do the things that you should have done 
uh, in the past, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have some some tackle questions. So uh, great to have you guys both on here. We're going to jump right in. We actually got some questions in advance this time from some insider members, and I want to make sure we get those up there first. So we had the first one from Matt, and I'm just going to read it to you. I can't put it up on the screen right now because it didn't come through uh, the streaming platform. So both coaches, listen up. Dropping my question now, and I'll tune in tonight. This is from Matt. Headed for a day trip to Mosquito Lagoon area tomorrow. It seems like we got a mini cold front pushing through today and tomorrow where the area won't get out of the 70s today and the air temperatures could drop into the 50s overnight. I'm expecting tough conditions tomorrow because of it. My plan is to start in a dredged out creek in the morning, hoping to find deeper water and then find wind protected coves with dark bottoms after the sun is up. Any thoughts or recommendations with these mini cold fronts pushing through? Now you both, they're talking, you're both of your home territory, Mosquito Lagoon. So which one of you wants to jump in on that one first? Um, I'd go like, first I'd like to go. Yeah. Um, I, it makes me think of, I remember fishing, one of the coldest days I've ever had fishing Mosquito Lagoon was the day it was Christmas Eve. My gosh, it was Christmas Eve 2012. And there was frost on my Highlander frost on the kayak. And I launched and we didn't start getting bites until 11 or 12 in the afternoon. Uh, oh, what's up, Matt? I see you in the in the chat section, dude. Um, he's like, I know exactly where I'm going tomorrow. I bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First off, your plan and your your viewpoints of wanting to fish around uh, a creek, like a, like a deeper dredged creek, it makes sense. But in all truth, and I, and I don't know that this translates all over to different parts of the southeast for inshore fishing applications, but the lagoon in particular and the river in particular, if we call it a mini cold snap, something that comes in real quick, and it's, I mean, temperatures in the 50s, and if you get some sun and it gets up into the high 60s and 70s, I wouldn't treat it that much different than you would treat any other spring day. If it's just a mini cold front, it might have a small effect on the water temp. Maybe it'll delay the time frame in which these fish will be more active in feeding. Because in the for those who don't know, Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River, there's really no tidal influence. Um, the water height's dependent on how much rain we have and uh, how strong the wind is and from what direction, north or south kind of blows water in and out, just, I guess, gravity fed or from pressure. Um, but Matt, I wouldn't be so hung up at, at least for those particular conditions in Florida, centrally, central West coast fifties, isn't that cold. And if you do have a sunny day on the outlook, I'd have to look at the weather too. Uh, and it does get bright quick. I, you wouldn't, you'd be surprised at these fish turning on a lot sooner than you might expect. Um, finding muddy bottom, I think is going to be a, a big thing. Barren sandy areas, and I think Pat would agree, can be a little tough when it's very cold out because if it is a little bit colder and the fish's metabolism slowed down a little bit, there's really nothing over barren sand for a fish to orient to as structure. There's nothing that they're going to find for relief and, and perch up and use as an ambush point. Um, darker bottom, they tend to blend in better in. So even whether it was warm or cold, they, they do enjoy these, these muddy bottom areas. Um, but especially when it's cold and it can hold a little bit of heat when that sun starts creeping up nine, 10 o'clock or so uh, muddy areas are going to be your friend. Um, the lagoon is crystal clear right now. So, you know, there could be some areas with some sp like sp sparse grass here and there, believe it or not. Uh, and, and surprisingly, even if there isn't mud, if you find grass or any sort of substrate other than just barren sand, you're more than likely going to find fish. It's surprisingly a really good time of the year right now. So without going too far into it, man, I know you'll appreciate it. Um, just be prepared to put in some mileage in the kayak, I think is what you'll be out in. Get to the east side, get out of, get out of the wind if you can. If you're warm, the fish are warm. At least that's what I've, I've experienced when it's cold. So I hope that helps. Good tips. Pat, did you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, actually, I have... <laughs> I will be fishing in the Mosquito Lagoon tomorrow, so I might run into you out on the water. Uh, but uh, the last uh, couple of times I've been out there, uh, you know, it's basically what Justin said is, is dead on. What was weird to me was up until we got this cold snap, maybe about two weeks ago, the fish really weren't relating to that soft, muddy bottom like they normally do. But these past couple of weeks, they definitely have been. So what you really need to look for is you need to find that soft, muddy bottom 
uh, that's got some, you know, that's exposed to the sun that is near deep water. Now, I wouldn't be, you know, going in any of these areas that have vast, you know, shallow water with no deep water access to it. I would look for something that's closer to deep water access. Uh, but there was another thing that I've, that's been surprising me, and I've seen this both in the southern end of the lagoon and up in the back country, is on days, you know, like tomorrow, it's still going to be in the 60s. So it's not going to be, you know, extremely cold. The fish have been related to windswept shorelines, meaning the wind is blowing the same direction as the shoreline is and not necessarily just wind protection. So uh, don't don't overlook those. Look for both. So check out your wind protection and your wind swept. Now, I would be surprised if you found any that were on wind blown shorelines, but those are the two shorelines that I would uh, I would look for. And like Justin said, be prepared to cover water. But when you find fish, they're usually grouped together. So you'll find more than one. They're usually stacking up this time of year. That's how it definitely is up in uh, yeah. in the mid Atlantic. If you find if you find one, you've usually found one hundred. And uh, whether they're active or not is a whole different question. But you know, it's about finding that one fish and then and then working from there. So good question, good answers, guys. Uh, I've never been to the Mosquito Lagoon, so I'm not going to chime in on that one. Um, but we're going to go to the next question from Travis, also an insider member. Uh, he's not sure if he can be here tonight. So he left the question earlier and he's going to watch the replay at the least. He's in the Houston Galveston area. Would you change baits, lures, rigs, tackle, time to go, what to look for, or anything else specifically for winter time for either surf fishing on the beach or pure fishing? Uh, it has a pretty good handle on the winter tactics for bays and marshes, but wondering for those scenarios for like a pure and surf in Galveston area. Okay, um, I'll take that one. Now he didn't he didn't say anything about species, right? He just mentioned surf fishing. So uh, in that neck of the woods there in Galveston, uh, you want to be near the inlets. And for me personally, I would prefer surf fishing over pier fishing. Now pier fishing can be great, but it's really hit and miss. You you know you're waiting for the fish to come to you. Whereas with surf fishing, you can read the beach and you've got kind of more control of that. Uh, so I definitely uh, beach fishing near inlets uh, as far as species are, is concerned. Uh, right now, even in the winter time, uh, you're catching uh, bull reds out in the surf. Uh, the black drum they're schooling out there before the spring. Um, you know before the they start uh, schooling up in the, you know, moving into the um, the inlets. They'll be out just outside the inlets. Uh, so black drum, definitely. Uh, shark, I don't know if you're interested in shark fishing. That's going to be good. Uh, whiting, if you're looking for table fare, that's definitely something uh, that uh, is possible. Now, Pompano, they're going to move. They're going to be moved further south. They're going to be down South Padre Island, Port Isabel. I don't think you're going to see any of those in Galveston. Maybe you might run into a wayward lost one, but, you know, that's not really something you'd target. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as baits go, uh, crab is really good. That's your standard for any of your drum, whether that be black drum or, or red drum. Uh, uh, shrimp catches, you know, pretty much anything. Uh, and then shark, uh, big pieces of cut bait. Uh, and also, if you're, if you're anywhere near the jetties, uh, and you're looking for a good fight, uh, Jack Ravel, you know, you can definitely run into those uh, big spoons, ounce and a half and bigger. Uh, you know, you want some pretty big gear on that one because these bruisers, uh, they can run 20, 30 pounds. And if you've never caught one before, uh, as they say, pound for pound, they're probably one of the best fighting fish out there. So uh, definitely, uh, definitely some opportunities for that. But it really, it really boils down to what you're after. Are you looking for a fighter? Are you looking for food or, you know, a little mixture of both? But winter fishing in Texas is, is still good. Yeah, I've, I've been watching all the reports from uh, from Wyatt and through the community and some really beautiful fish being taken right now in Texas. I'm I'm really jealous. It makes me want to wish I had a uh, RV and <laughs> could head down there and and fish down in there right now. Uh, good information there. Uh, you know, it's I'm, funny. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say, are you going to head down there next? Yep. One one week from now, I'm, I'll be in Texas. Oh, okay. See, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'll be in the cold weather up here in the uh, mid Atlantic. Uh, so, so it makes sense. You're, you've been paying really close attention to what you're going to be getting into in the next week or two. So, 
good information there. We have another mm -hmm. one from an insider, and then we have a bunch in the chat. So I'm going to get this last one here that was put in ahead of time by Peter. Uh, just wondering, th this is a really good question. I'd like everybody's perspective on this. I don't know if we're going to agree on this or not. Now, I'm going to start off just wondering how important it really is to retrieve your paddle tail or any other lure for that matter with the current. I've seen bait fish with their nose into the current plenty of times. So I'm a little confused. Um, bait fish swim all over the place. No? Well, absolutely correct. They will swim in every different direction. It depends on where they're going, why they're moving. Um, with that said, I will say as a coach and before I was a coach, I would tell people it is most important to retrieve with the current. And uh, that doesn't mean that you can't catch them when going against the current or across the current. I catch a lot of fish that way as well. However, most of the time when you're talking about in inshore, and for me, my perspective is generally draining marshes, right? So when the marshes are draining and the water's coming out, those fish are traveling with the current and they're, they have to get out of those areas that are draining. So that's generally where I'm coming from when I'm talking about, about, you know, retrieving with the current. So it's more natural. It's more natural to have the, the baits and the lures coming with the current because that's the, the prevailing direction of the current. And that's the direction that most of the forage and most of the bait fish is traveling. It's just, it's just moving in that direction. You could go the other way. And sometimes fish do often you'll see bunker going into a current or into the wind because they're filter feeders. Well, a lot of these, these bait fish are not filter feeders. So they're, if they're going against the current, they're probably going after something or getting away from something. Uh, so that's the way that I typically look at it. You will find more bait traveling with the current. Generally speaking, it doesn't mean they don't turn around and face in for a minute, but then they end up going with the current again. They keep going back with the current. And they let the current take them. It's just easier. They're burning less calories to do it. So they do it. Uh, so that that's generally my answer for it. So yes, you can catch them in any direction, but I would almost always, I can't think of, I'm saying almost because I can't think of an exception, but I'm sure there is one. I would, I would almost always start fishing with the current. Then I would go across the current and then I would go into the current, uh, you know, cast down current and, and pull it back up into it. That's the order I would do it. Pat, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that one. To be to be honest with you, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, in current, out of current, heading the direction, I'm, um, you know, envisioning in my mind, what direction is that predatory fish facing? And almost always that predatory fish is going to be facing into the current because that's where his food is coming from or its food is coming from. So that's why I'm going to be throwing up current and reeling in with the current. Uh, and a lot of that has also, you know, has to do with how strong that current is too and the type of fish that you're after you know, are the fish that you're after, are they uh, a type of uh, fish that likes current? You know, we talk about, you know, redfish down here. Redfish really don't like to fight current. So they're going to kind of try to be out of it, but say, you know, a snook, you know, they'll, they're right at home in current. So, um, you know, you can, you can look at it that way. Trout kind of the same way they, they'll get in that current, but more, more in the seams. But for me, I can't really think of a scenario where I would prefer uh, to cast and re retrieve against the current. I'm, I'm going to be either perpendicular or with a current every time. Fair enough. Justin, agree or do you have something different? Yeah, I'm not going to be like the, the tiebreaker, like pick one side <laughs> or the other. <laughs> uh, for me, it is fishing with the current most of the time. It's a conveyor belt presentation. Your shrimp, your mud minnows, your mullet, whatever, whatever the bait fish is, whether it's an inlet or a marsh creek or anything. Um, presenting your lure or bait offering in a manner where it flows in the same direction and speed uh, as the current. So fishing with the current, not against it, would be my my go-to for, for most inshore fishing applications. Uh, bouncing a power prawn on bottom through the current or, or cross current, as you've pointed out, Rich, would be like plan B. Um, I have thrown against the current. And as Pap kind of pointed out, I think it's species specific. So those guys, I don't know how you guys do it for stripers up in the Northeast, but you could take a North bar down to the South Jetty of Sebastian Inlet on a strong outgoing tide. And you could just let that North bar, that bottle plug or a, a wind cheater sit in the current and just inch your handle back. You're nodding. Cause you're like, yeah, it's a technique we do. And for snook, it's, 
the same thing. I mean, snooker, our striper down here in Florida, right. very, very similar behavior, especially around inlets and heavy current areas. That's probably one of the only times I'm going to work against the current. And I'm really imitating a bigger bait fish, like a big mullet or a big lady fish that has no problem facing into the current. I don't know why mullet would face into the current, but they do. Big hog leg 10, 12 inch mullet will face into a hard outgoing tide and they'll just sit there and sway back and forth. And every now and again, a big snook or a tarpon will just go and crash at them. And that mullet could not move. It could just be vibrating in the current, minding its own business, and a monster predator will come up and hammer it. But that's about the only time I can see working against the current has its advantages. Very situational. Most of the time, we're all in agreement. It's the conveyor yep. belt concept. Where present your sushi on that board that's coming by and they'll get to choose what they want to eat. Then you just present over and over and it's really a numbers game. Yeah. And I think one thing for people to keep in mind is, especially if you're talking an ambush predator, ambush predators, when they're set up to ambush, they're not moving around. They're ambushing. Yeah. If you're going to ambush somebody in the woods, you're not walking around all around them. You know, you're not, you're not bouncing around in plain view. You're hunkering down somewhere and then you're coming out, you're coming out for your, your ambush. Let's say you're playing tag, right? You're playing tag. You're not running around out in front of everybody. Uh, and, and now striped bass are not always, when you're fishing for striped bass, you're not, they're not hunkering, right? When, when you're doing that, they're typically on the feed, they're running, you know, they're, they're in the migration and, and stuff like that. So, you know, and bluefish is the other one where I guess I, I do go against the current quite often because bluefish just don't care. The more mayhem, the better for them. So just, you know, chop it up, do whatever you can. All right. So that's a good answer. We've got, man, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to, I'm going to start hammering through some of these already. First one up here is from Paul. And this is an important one. And I think I can answer it really quickly from Paul Pence. What is wind swept? So, and th this is important, especially if you listen to salt strong coaches, because when you're talking inshore, we talk about wind swept or wind protected shorelines. And it's important to understand the difference. So wind protected means that the wind is coming off of the shore. It's not the water right up against the shore is not getting beaten by the wind. And then wind swept means the wind is just sweeping right over that. So it's basically if you're facing into the into the shore, the wind is at your back and it's really just beating against that shoreline. And it can be important because it, and a lot of people don't realize this, but for water temperatures, especially in the winter, if you're in a wind protected shoreline, it's typically and and here's the one variable that people don't always talk about. If the air temperature is colder than the water, you're going to have a warmer temperature on the wind protected shoreline because it's not getting cut up. It's not getting, the air is not getting into that water to cool it down. So you don't want the riffles on the top. You don't want the chop because that's the mixing of the wind with the water. So you get that colder air into the warmer water, it cools down the water. So now keep in mind, there is a reverse side of that. If you have a really warm wind and it's winter time and it's a lot warmer than the water, sometimes you do want that wind swept side because for the same reason, it's churning up that water and it's heating it up. And a lot of people leave that second half out, but it, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. You have a 50 degree day, 40 degree water. You might want to look for that wind swept side. Can I interject real quick? Yeah. That's a really, really good point. That's... I. My background before I, I worked in the fishing industry is in fisheries and aquatic science. And I'm, I'm a big science dork too. Water and air are always trying to meet at an equilibrium together. They're trying to make sure that the exchange of both available oxygen and temperature are, are balanced to where they're the same. They're constantly working to try to meet each other at some sort of middle ground, right? So you're right, if you got hot and cold or cold and hot, and that wind is blowing by that surface that's that's you know bubbling over and waves are crashing every time a bubble happens a single pop happens that's an exchange between the surface and the water and they're trying to balance out with one another um and that's so true kind of an off topic for, for oxygen in a bait bucket or, or live well when people add a bubbler to a bucket to keep shrimp or minnows or whatever alive you're not adding any oxygen into that water. I think right. people need to realize that you're just making the oxygen that's in the water available by having that interference of bubbles popping at the surface and allowing for those micro exchanges to happen in the atmosphere to where the water's bubbling over. That's all that it is. 
you're not going to add oxygen until you put a diffuser and an oxygen tank into the water and aggressively pump oxygen and hypersaturate it. It's the only way you're going to add oxygen. Otherwise, physically churning and mixing it over is just kind of like buying you time if it right. were. Um, but man, that's so true. And I, I don't think about that often when I'm fishing, but that's a good point. Yeah. It's the, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people say, well, you have to go wind protected cause it's winter. Well, not always. It depends. It yeah. depends. Sometimes you do want to, you do want to go wind swept. So I think that was an important one because we talk about wind protected and wind swept so often. Uh, that's an important one, especially for insiders. So they, they can truly understand what we're talking about. Just the direction of the wind and how it's hitting the water in that any given area. All right, so we've got a bunch of other questions here. I'm just gonna keep rolling through some of these. This one, Justin, is for you. It's from uh, Larry. Larry is a longtime viewer of this stream. Any recommendations on a bait casting rod paired with a 150 size reel for bay flounder? Larry, I'll see your comment if you chime back in, but I mean, Rich, speak up. Are you guys talking about flounder up in your neck of the woods up in the Northeast? Are we talking about like Southern flounder and Gulf flounder down here in Florida. I don't think there's much difference, but the sizing difference between both. Are you talking about fluke? You I, talking about yeah. Fluke? He's probably talking fluke. I would say, you know, okay. Southern, I mean, Southern and uh, summer are fairly close except at the very high end. So yeah. I would say anything up to, let's say 28 inches. So it's kind of a fine line. I don't want to go too far into that. I think that ideally what I would personally want and I'd if you have different feedback on this, Rich, tell me. I'd want a moderate fast rod. I wouldn't want something that's extremely fast. I want a little more of a parabolic bend. It's just whether you're going to be offering a bait presentation or you're going to be jigging, you want to make sure that initial hook set and that connection is solid and then allow for the bend of the rod to be able to stay connected to that fish. There are fish that's known for just somehow houdiniing off of the hook, and I just want a little bit of give in whatever that's going to be. <laughs> Um, so I, I would reach for a mod fast application. If you feel comfortable with a mod, a moderate fine, but I worry when you get into things that exceed an ounce and a half, two ounces, moderate being a little bit too noodly and kind of losing control at, at depth and with some increased current. So I think mod fast would be a good approach brands. I'm not super partial to any brand. Go with star St. Croix Fenwick, something you're comfortable with, but get your hands on it. Make sure you've got a bend point about halfway down the rod. And that, that tends to be a good kind of benchmark for me. That's what I would think. All right. Pat, do you have any thoughts on that one? I don't know if you do a lot of flounder fishing. No, I'm with Justin. Uh, when I'm in North Carolina, I seem to, even by accident. Okay. Um, okay. No, I, I'm with Justin on that. The uh, flounder, I think, are probably, out of all the fish I go after, the, the hardest ones to actually get in the boat. And I think that extra give that a moderate fast action or even a moderate action rod gives you will keep that fish pinned. And especially if you're using braided line, there has to be some sort of uh, give there. There's got to be a cushion there. So uh, if, you, if you're using braid that has no stretch, then there, the cushion has to be in the rod. So I, I agree with, uh, with what Justin says for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in because fluke is really my number one targeted species throughout the year. We don't have the, you know, all the species that you have down south. Fluke is is one of the biggest ones up here. And I do like a, a moderate fast to fast action rod. And I do jig and I do use live bait and I use it all on the same rod. So I fish out of a kayak 99% of the time. And I like to get multifunctional rods. So I actually use for fluke the same rods that I use for 45, 50 inch striped bass. Uh, and and you just have to know how to work them differently for each fish. But I, I do for that reason, I go more with the moderate fast or fast action for those rods. If it's a special dedicated fluke rod, which I do have, that is a moderate action. And I do really like that. Um, it has just enough oomph to it that I can I can set that hook hard, and it has enough give that it can keep up with those head shakes, for the most part. I do I do have a habit for those people that watch the stream or saw my old YouTube channel. I am notorious for losing flounder, and mm -hmm. uh, but I will say it's 99% of the time because I am terrible at netting. I had this little $16 cheap net. <laughs> because I couldn't find a good one. I now have an ego, which I absolutely love. Ego too. I'm going to do yeah. a review on that. I love Plus that. Two. Dude, they're good nets, man. I've had some oh, rubber yeah. and a few sliders and stuff. They're good stuff. 
that that is going to be a game changer for me because I don't have this thing that I put in the water and it just bends. <laughs> so I've had a lot of that. So I'm terrible at netting them, but it's not it's it's actually the netting that um that I, that causes me to lose them. And I will mention one thing: why the moderate will help when you get some of these bigger fluke. They and if you're not aware of this, just know this: there are two things they can do that you probably don't see. First, they can go aerial; they can jump out of the water. And with their head shakes, they can shake that really quick. So having that little extra bend in that rod helps with that. And they can also go backwards. So if you pull them in, they can go backwards. And um, I, I found that the softer tips, the more action, you know, bending more at the middle of the rod has helped me to keep them buttoned up with that. So when I'm on the medium fast or, my, or not the medium, the, uh, the fast or the extra fast rods that I have, almost guaranteed I lose them when they go backwards. It's almost a guarantee. So good question. Very good question there, uh, Larry. We've got another question coming up. Let's see. I'll answer this one real quick. This is for Bill. Bill D, any tog available by the inshore jetties in South Jersey or are they all out in the deep water? So Bill, I will tell you this. It is going to be tough to get the tog next to those jetties right now because that water temperature with that cold snap right after Christmas really messed up the bite. Um, it's so much so that you're seeing the offshore bites getting impacted because the water temperatures are so low. So you're talking in the low 40s and, and that's just at the surface temperature inshore. I don't know what it is offshore, but I can tell you it's pretty cold. It's getting hit in the face with the spray last week. It was pretty cold. So we're probably down low 40s, upper 30s. So are there tog there? Yes. But are there a lot of tog? Probably not. I, I don't think so. I was actually considering going down later this week. Uh, I'll let you know if I head down and we can join each other. But um, I'm thinking you're going to be talking a bunch of shorts. The big the big girls have moved off at this point and will be off probably until late March. All right. So that's that one. I'm assuming you two don't want to chime in on the tog question. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, man. Have you ever seen a tog live? <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's here's a good one. And this one is going to be for the the two of you from Slab Daddy 52. What's the best lure and bait setup for the Florida panhandle in May? Keep I uh, I'll, okay, I'll, Pat, I'll start. With you. Yeah, no, yeah, you go. You go, Pat. Okay, good, good. Um okay. Um you know, it, it's one of those things. I'll go ahead. I think I've got a delay here. <laughs> Go. Uh, okay. Um, you know, reading the question, what's the best lure and bets, uh, bait set up for the Florida pan handle? You know, using terms best is is kind of, you know, it's one of those things. It really depends on the situation. So for me, if I'm fishing in the pan handle, I'm going to have a setup where I'm going to start early with top water. And then I'm probably going to have, depending on what the weather's doing, I'm going to have a paddle tail tied on. And then I'm probably going to have a either a jerk bait or a shrimp imitation tied on. And that way I can cover all three of the water columns. I love top water. If anybody knows me, I'm a top water nut. Uh, so I'm going to go throw, throw top water as much as I can. Now, that's just me, though. That might not be the best thing that's going to be catching fish. But you really need to make sure and just do your setups to where you can cover all the water columns and be able to pivot easily. So um, I like multiple rod setups. I like, like I said, a top water, a paddle tail, and then something I can uh, bounce along the bottom and pattern these fish out. And that way you can kind of dial in the bite from there. Uh, so that's typically what I do from spring to fall, you know, anywhere where I'm fishing is that kind of setup. Yeah. Keep it, keep it simple. Don't, don't overcomplicate and think that there's a hard and a fast best. Generally speaking, seven foot and seven foot six mm -hmm. medium powered fast action rod for anywhere in the southeast uh, and a 2,500 to 3,000 size spinning reel, 10 or 15 pound braid, 20 pound liter monofilament or fluorocarbon. Pick your flavor. I doesn't matter. Uh, and for lure presentation, I think Pat's spot on. Work the water column. Even if it's two foot, you've got top water, you got middle of the water column, yeah. and you got a lure you can bounce bottom with. As long as you have those three types of profiles, like a, you know, I got one here, so I'm just going to grab it. Like a Rapala skitter walk for the top, especially in May, get some opportunities at trout and some bull redfish, believe it or not, come up shallow. Uh, Midwater column can be mm -hmm. a jerk shad. It can be a paddle tail. 
that's those are two perfectly acceptable items. Bouncing bottom can also be a jerk shad or a paddle tail as well, or you can do a shrimp presentation. So just top, mid, and bottom is really more so your focus than finding an all-around best. Very good. Very good. All right, next question. I don't know. Well, I, I can't help with this one. Pat, I don't even know if you can. Justin, we're going to see if you can. This is like that tuna question we had before. Yeah. I was wondering what the best strategy to catch a red grouper in the Gulf of Mexico would be. From CL Outdoors. Red grouper in the Gulf of Mexico, like any way possible? I feel like CL, you asked that uh, troll for red grouper. And is it possible? Yeah, but red grouper are not like gag grouper. They don't have the same type of aggressiveness, if you will. Uh, I kind of think like the red groupers um what is it lenny from of mice and men like that's kind of out of view the red grouper they're just they're goofy they're gonna hang around they're gonna look for an easy opportunity the gags are the ones that are going to catch you by surprise and they're gonna absolutely hammer potentially a trolling plug um so if you want to target red grouper out in the gulf they're not super picky a variety of you know like squid or or even crabs or shrimp would would work for them even bait fish sardines and threadfin Something smelly and, you know, dead works really well. Kind of view them like a catfish. They taste great and they're a lot of fun to catch. Don't get me wrong. I don't have anything bad to say about a red grouper. I just, if you're specifically targeting those, and I think it's because it's open until gag opens up. Oh, I want to say like September. I know they just changed the rules this year and it hurts to say that out loud. Um, you know, a, a variety of live and dead bait works. Uh, you can get them on jigs. That's a whole other conversation. You can bounce bucktails in a, a strip of bonito on bottom. That works just like you guys would for fluke. It work, would work very well for red grouper. Um, but I think kind of like the best go-to would be like a dead sardine on a knocker rig uh, and then bounce some bucktails or some vertical jigs or slow pitch jigs just for fun. That would be the way I'd go about it. Very good. We're, we're going to stay on this topic of, well, uh, actually, no, this is not grouper. Okay. Let me bring this one up though. So we've got a guy, Albert, in California looking for a place to catch red snapper in the U.S. When is the best time? Where and when is the best time? You have a lot, you have a lot of options. Um, yeah. yeah if, whether it's the Gulf or the Atlantic, you have a lot of options. Generally speaking, in the Gulf, you, you do need to run pretty far to be able to get to them. You're averaging 10 to 20 miles at the on the low side out of parts of the gulf and i say that because wyatt has gotten on some red snapper fishing some of the shallower oil rigs uh, out of texas the central east coast you know of florida which is like north new summer daytona down to about that sebastian inlet area uh they're a nuisance they're the endangered red snappers like we're super endangered and we say that because there's ridiculous like um regulations on that species on the atlantic coast but they get big and they're relatively common uh, once you make your way out to hit at least that 90 to 100 foot mark. Ideally, that 160 to 200 foot depth is like the, the prime range to target red snapper. Um, and I think you also asked best time of the year. Uh, yeah. I feel like summer. Like you, you can't get away from them between May and August, September. Um, you have shots at them in winter too. They're still a year round fish. But it's always when you want to go catch that big gag or that mutton snapper that, I mean, even when you want to catch kingfish, believe it or not, they'll come up from 160 foot and hit a flat line on the surface and take you down to the reef. And it's frustrating. So uh, I think you'll be perfectly fine. When you get closer to that time, reach out to us at Salt Strong. Like, come talk to us. We'll help give you more of a an updated, uh, you know, ear to the ground of what's happening. And you just pick a destination and we'll help you out. Um, but Central East Coast, about 20 miles out, should be pretty easy to get on them. It's funny you'd say that you know they're very protected and it, it sounds like our black sea bass up here they're yeah. they're so you know that's they, they have to take care of them and you cannot get away from them when you're offshore at times i mean they are they're literally all over the place but they're it's getting worse apparently <laughs> yeah so i don't know i don't fish for them that often so i'm just saying based on what everyone else says i just hear people saying i couldn't get away from the from the sea bass I'm like well they're they're lowering the limits again next year. <laughs> it hurts. I don't. It, I don't want to talk about it. So. Yeah, I don't. I don't get it. All right, we'll go on to a happier topic. 
here, and this is from Coconuts Fishing. Pat, this one's going to be for you. Do you feel that using a larger artificial will, will keep you from catching the smaller fish? Um, or will the underslot fish still take that larger lure? Yeah, um, there there is that thought process, big bait, big fish, but uh, don't think just because you're throwing a bigger lure doesn't mean the smaller, more aggressive fish are going to go after it. You know, I think we've all caught fish that were just about the size of the lure that we were throwing. Um, we have a, uh, a lure, a paddle tail, just for, in case the guys aren't familiar, it's called a bomber. It's a five inch paddle tail. And, you know, I've caught you know, trout that weren't much bigger than that one, maybe eight inches, just because they're aggressive. Now, typically, you know, you might cut down on it, but just don't think you're going to eliminate it. So uh, you can go with the big bait, big fish theory, but don't, you know, don't think that uh, everything you're going to catch is going to be big. I like to, you know, kind of stick to more of a midsize one. Believe it or not, I'll throw a smaller bait just to kind of dial the bite in just to see where the fish are hanging out at. But, you know, between like, say, we have three different paddle tails that that we have here at Salt Strong. It's our three and a half inch, what we call a 2.0. We have a mulligan that's a four inch, then our bomber that's a five inch. I love that four inch mulligan. I think that is a great compromise between, uh, you know, a smaller bait and a larger one. So those midsize four inch plastics well you know of course mid-sized to us down here in the southeast i know you guys in the northeast are throwing foot-long baits but uh but yeah i like i like those uh mid-sized uh baits it, it, it's a a quantity and a quality thing yeah and i think there's a it, it does depend on species i mean the more aggressive the species the more likely you are to catch a small fish on a large lure you know you, you can catch a 12 inch mm -hmm. fluke because they're people don't realize how aggressive flounder slash fluke are. I mean, they are like terrorists under there, under the water. I mean, they will go after anything that, that annoys them slightly. And you can have an eight inch soft plastic and you'll catch a 12 inch fish, you know, and it'll have the whole thing down its throat and it'll be choking on it when you pull it in. Um, striped bass is another thing. I mean, you can catch, you can catch little schoolies at about, I mean, sub schoolies, little rats at like 14 inches on an eight inch bait, you know, 10 inch bait, they'll, they'll go after it. And not only that, they'll hit it hard <laughs> and they'll fight. They sometimes hit it harder than the, you know, the 30 pounders. Um, so you can still catch them. However, if you are targeting something that's smaller, I do like to size down and make it a little bit easier on them. Um, generally the larger, when I look at larger artificials, I think of a different class of lure. So Pat talked about the 2.0, the mulligan and the bomber. Those are, you know, the, the, those three different sizes up to the five inch. Those are still similar profiles. When I talk about a larger bait for striped bass, as an example, I'm looking at something that has an entirely different profile. So I'm looking at an eight to 10 inch, um, swim shad, like a tsunami, I think it's tsunami or a storm holographic. I mean, they're 10 inches, but they're not thin. They're like really big. They look like, they look like a spot or they look like a, uh, a bunker. I mean, they, they, it's a whole different profile. So that's the way that I look at. Now, with that said, I have caught 20, low 20 inch uh, striped bass on 10 inch huge paddle tails. So, you know, generally speaking, the larger the lures, the you will weed out some of the less aggressive fish, but sometimes, I mean, if they want it, they're going to go get it. Try to tell a blowfish not to go after a 12 inch lure and it'll just destroy it in seconds. It, does, it doesn't matter. It could be this big, it could be four inches long and it'll destroy that foot long soft plastic that you just spent $10 on at the tackle shop. I just wanted to, I wanted to hold these up just for hyperbole, like a little power prawn shrimp lure will catch you a monster 40 inch black drum monster 40 inch redfish when presented properly. Oh, I forgot to put a, I put a little rattle in there. I was like, what is that little mark? I was already ready to go. Uh, and then something like that, you know, a 400 gram slow pitch jig will catch the tiniest lizard fish in 500 feet of water. So, you know, and I, I've caught fish smaller than this jig fishing offshore. Offshore might be a whole different ballgame, but, um, but yeah, sometimes elephants eat peanuts and sometimes the, the runts will hit the biggest thing in your tackle box and they will be like the chihuahua that thinks yeah. it's way bigger than it actually is. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. All right. Here's one for you, Justin. I think you, you kind of touched on this yeah. before. I think you know this one's coming from James. Looking at a seven to seven six light moderate action to throw very light Ned rigs. Pat, you'll probably have something to say about this. Pairing it up with the Florida Fishing Products 2500 CE with six pound braid. 
site casting. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Pat's going to be very happy to hear this because Pat actually got that rod from me and it is perfect. And tell me if I'm wrong, Pat, but it would be a star rod VPR seven foot four to 10. That's like, I mean, it's a, it's a good rod. If you really want to dial in that specific approach, uh, that would be what I'd reach for. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have a hard time finding it in a shop, um, for where you're at, Jimmy, like, I don't know if sodium tackles too far North of you. Um, or if you really want to go online and find it, it's a seven foot. The star doesn't have mediums and medium lights and medium heavies. They do pound test. So VPR spinning rod, seven foot, four to 10. And uh, Pat tweak one way or the other by another brand. If you can think of another model, if he has a hard time finding that, um, price point wise, you kind of felt that Omen Uh, gold rod I had that was a seven, six, Omen gold there. Yeah. You're not going to mm-hmm. find them in a tackle shop, but that was kind of nice. That yeah. could work. What are your thoughts, Pat? What else do you think would be a good rod? Um, maybe even going down to it, it, that, that weight range is, uh, is kind of the sticking point, but this, uh, the sieges, the light action sieges, what might be a, uh, a good backup. Um, but I, I did like that Omen uh, gold that, uh, that you got that, that was a really for an entry level, you know, it, it's all about price point. You know, we talk about good, better, best, and and what, you know, the best rod out there. I will 100% agree the best Ned Rig rod I've ever thrown is that Star VPR. If you can find one, uh, jump all over it. It's great. Um, but in, in that price point, I think maybe the Sieges and then that Omen Gold. Uh, off the top of my head, those are the two uh, others that I've liked. Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking there's others that I've used, but I think those are the best that I've, that I've used in those price points. Yeah, I feel like there's there's got to be a, a St. Croix option, but I felt some Avid medium lights, and I felt some the Tournament Legend medium lights, and I, yeah, there with St. Croix or either it's like too much of a wet noodle, or it's a little too crisp, and the rod feels yeah. a little too bulbous with just a light tip. It doesn't feel like a thin, crisp blank all the way through. This gets a little tricky. I think we gave you some good recommendations, Jimmy. I think you'll you'll find something between those options. I would say so. Good luck finding the star rods. I love yeah. star rods, by the way. They're but they're impossible to find anymore. <laughs> yeah. They're they're good kayak rods. I don't cry when I lose them, and I've lost some. <laughs> All right, here's one uh from Meltac. What's a good rod to match up with the Daiwa BG forty five hundred for reds, king mackerel, cobia, and the occasional tarpon? So the full gamut here. I'll grab it. I'll be right back. Keep talking. Okay. <laughs> Daiwa BG. I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure because of the, uh, the King mackerel in there. Uh, I would, I honestly, he's not going to say this one, but I like the, the TFO pro medium heavy. And I have caught very large striped bass on that uh, up to just under 50 inches. So I'm going to assume that you're going to have the power for the reds, uh, the reds in there and the occasional tarpon. Yeah, the, the so, only issue is that Daiwa BG4500, it's a massive reel. It's big. Yeah, it's like a, the size of everybody else's yeah. 8,000 or 10,000. It's a monster reel. Like 22 yeah. ounces, right? 22 ounces, that's a, that's a, that's a big striper reel. Yeah. Um, for, okay, so for what you're doing, yeah. I didn't grab my eight-footers up on the rack, but I have an eight-foot star sequence that is a 20 to 50-pound class, and it's fantastic for 180 bucks very difficult to find. Like I seldom ever even saw it in shops here in Florida for what you're doing. And I've targeted all of those species and I've even caught a couple really nice tarpon. This is surprisingly a really nice rod. This is a Fitzgerald stunner HD. This is the seven foot four extra heavy. It says it's a 50 to 80 pound class, three quarter ounce to five ounce range, which is pretty wide. I think it very comfortably throws one, one and a half to three you know, that's like the sweet range, but this is, it's, it's a great rod, about 220, 230 bucks, really heavy duty, beefed up double footed guides, which I think you can't say enough about when you're under a load on a big tarpon, the tarpon's really what's going to, what's going to test you. You know, you're, you're a big bull red, a king mackerel, even a cobia, even you can take it for red snapper and some gags, you know, in relatively shallow areas, sub 150. Um, the tarpon is probably going to be the thing that tests the rod the most because it's just a long, grueling fight. It's a 20, 30-minute fight, and you want to be able to have a rod that puts a ton of heat on the fish. 
This rod's surprisingly lightweight, but it's still a composite build, so it's also glass and and graphite. So you don't have to worry about that rod snapping. You have a lot of power all the way down into the real seat, and it's an aluminum real seat. And whole different topic about that, but I like graphite real seats. I think they feel great in hand. Aluminum is uncompromising. So when you find the right way to attach aluminum to graphite, because the only Achilles seal about aluminum is that the adhering process of epoxying a graphite rod onto an aluminum real seat is that you have to score it so that it can adhere a little bit better. It might not adhere as well as a graphite. I keep doing air quotes because what the difference might be, it doesn't adhere five or 10% less of what like a graphite real seat would be. But when that's under a load, that's not going to crack. It's not going to break. You can put a serious amount of heat and a BG 4,500 would actually pair perfectly on this rod. So this is somebody who's tested a lot of heavy duty, big game rods over the past 10 years for anything you want to target in the Southeast near shore. And I feel really confident in that option. Very good. All right. So we're in our last about nine minutes. We're going to start flying people. We're going to try to hit at least a little bit, at least a quick answer on all the things that are that are left in there. We're not going to get all of them. If you're an insider member and we don't get to your question, ask it inside the community. Use the ask a coach function. And we and, of course, everybody else in the community will jump in and, and answer those questions. So I'm going to try to run through these. And we're just going to have to. And, and I apologize. I'm going to miss some. So. Uh, my apologies, but we, we're limited time right now. So the first one right here from Jeremy, do you ever target fish and build all your plans and adjustments to that fish, or do you abandon a species for the sake of catching fish? So what I'm guessing this is asking is, do you ever spend all your time making your plan, getting set up, going out, targeting a fish, and it's just not working out? Do you still go with it, or do you switch and uh, change things up during the day? That's my interpretation of that question. Uh, Pat, really what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, really depends on uh, how bad I want to get that targeted fish. If it's, uh, you know, I got my heart set on the redfish, then I will fish for redfish all day long. But uh, say if I'm fishing a tournament where I need to get a slam uh, and I have windows for certain fish, then yeah, I'll abandon fish to go find other fish. But it really depends on on what I'm trying to do that day, what I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to agree. Typically, the tournaments up here that I'm fishing, it's it's single species for most of them. So I'm I'm dug in all day from sun up to sundown uh, on that one thing. There are times there though that I will abandon my plans if they're not working and I will and I will reassess and I will make a new plan in the middle of the day. So you have to be willing to do that just because you spent 15 20 minutes or even 2 hours the night before planning, if it's not working, it's not going to work. So just take a second if you're in a kayak, clip off to sod bank somewhere and reassess and and go with a new plan and you'll, you'll end up getting your fish. And often it's still going to be your targeted species. You're just catching it a different way. All right, Dakota Henderson, thoughts on the Z-Man chatterbait jig head or chatterbaits for inshore fishing? For me, it's a dirty water scenario and deep water scenario. So I, I look to add uh, specifically the three eighths ounce gold eye, the chatterbait head, the Z-Man chatterbait head. And you can put a variety of different soft plastics on the back end. And I feel like, the success that I have had using it was fishing with um, uh, Richard, who he was one of our coaches on the team up in Jacksonville and bouncing uh, Alabama leprechaun around using that chatterhead fishing for me, deeper water, dirtier water. It brings a lot of attention to the lure um, and you kind of want to stand out in those type of conditions. Um, they could work well in clear water scenarios, but I pretty much would use it for uh, an ambush predator like a snook around structure. And I'd, I'd keep it on the move pretty quick not give the fish a lot of time to think about it. Very good. I, I'm not going to change anything about that answer right there. All right. This one is going to be a tough one to answer. And I'm going to do this because I'm pretty sure neither of you have ever targeted what's called winter flounder, or maybe you don't even know they exist. That is a species. All right. So this is a very difficult question from crab and fishing. So this is Ben. So Ben's asking, where, what areas in southern New Jersey should you target winter flounder? Well, just keep in mind first, Ben, they are out of season. So their season, despite being called winter flounder, they're not a winter targeted fish. So you can't target them right now. However, don't target them in southern New Jersey. They're not there. 
Um, they used to be back in the 80s. They are not there anymore. If you want to target them, you need to look somewhere. I would say, well, you may catch a few south of this. I would look at Barnegat Inlet and North, and uh, I'd be looking up in that area. And if you want to target them when they're really in season offshore, you can catch them off of southern New Jersey offshore out at the wrecks when you're doing deep, uh, deep sea fluke fishing. But that's really going to be your best bet. You're not going to find them in southern New Jersey. And I can tell you how I know. I can tell you how many hours I've spent looking for them <laughs> and talking to the old timers. And uh, it's the it's generally accepted right now until somebody proves it wrong that they have been gone since the 1980s. And they were never there in huge, huge numbers in South Jersey. Um, and they're, they just don't seem to be there in any numbers at this point. So you guys, a, a winter flounder has has no teeth. They have no teeth. That's weird. Yeah, that's where you get the flounder versus fluke argument because there are winter flounder and they're called the flounder up here. So if you say flounder to a New York person, they think you're talking winter flounder and not a summer flounder. All right, and we're gonna. Put, I thought that was just uh, the flounder we catch in December. Yeah, <laughs> when I yeah, that's what I thought it was when I was little too. I was like, I, I can go for winter. All right, here here's a, one more, and then we're gonna do. So we got two more that we're gonna be able to get time here for. Mister Get Real People using a pen battle three six thousand for surf casting. What braid leader combo test would you use trying to hit the third trough? Oof, I don't know where you are. But if you're hitting the third trough in South Jersey, that's a lot different than hitting the third trough in yeah. in Florida or or Delaware. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, just going to say for distance. Let's just say it's for distance casting because third trough is usually pretty far. Minimum twenty or uh, minimum maximum thirty pound braid. I'd aim between the twenty and thirty pound braid setup, depending on how heavy your sinker setup is going to be. If you're throwing a Sputnik or you're throwing a pyramid, uh, you're going to get some distance with a Sputnik. Um, really it's not so much about the leader combination as it is your main braided line size and the weight that you're going to be throwing on the end of that rig. Um, so I think 20 pound for distance, but if you throw a really heavy sinker, you throw in an eight ounce sinker or bigger and you got a hard snap cast, you need to make sure your connection of the leader you're using isn't going to snap off. Like if you go too thin on your leader and you got a hard whip on that cast, you're going to snap some sort of line to line connection or that weight connection on the end. So it's it's a fine line, but I say 20 to 30 pound braid, and then your leader line isn't really going to affect your casting distance. Just use a leader line that's appropriate for the heavier weights you're going to throw to get that distance, so that the connection is solid. Yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to say I would use a 30 pound braid, just because I'm always afraid I'm going to snap the rod and hit myself in the back with the you know or snap the line or something like that. So if you're if you're going to cast properly for a surf caster and you're going to snap that rod and you're going to make the rod do the work, I, I would go with the 30 just because I'm thinking third trough, South Jersey style. I mean, you're over 100 yards out. So yeah. you're going to be hauling that thing and you're probably going to be hauling six, eight ounces. Um, and as for the the leader, I would use I would use the 30 pound braid and then I would use a 40 pound leader. Real simple. Now, watch, he's probably in some place where the third trough is like 40 yards away and he can just underhand it to it. <laughs> but that's the best that we can answer right now. And then the last one, because we do need to get this going, or if I can see it here. This is from somebody that needs a lot of help. A lot of help. No, not that one. Where did he go? This one. <laughs> From Matt in a yak with eight rods in the back. <laughs> Can one of you guys tell me how to find the best fishing spots in my area? So I'm going to jump in on this one. Yeah, I'm going to say, Matt, I can help you with this. What you have to do is reach out to Pat Ogletree. When he drives by the panhandle on his way to Texas, <laughs> just jump in behind him and follow him to the local watering, uh, the local launch and uh, follow him around. He'll get you on some fish. It's even easier than that. If you, <laughs> if you can find water then you will find fish, Matt. It's that simple. So if you know that there's water in your area, this is probably going to be fish there, okay? And then video it because we need to see it. And good luck yeah. to you, Matt, for your uh, your redfish uh, tournament coming up. Yeah, man. 
Good luck to you. So, all right, guys, with that, we're going to have to cut it here, but I want to thank my two guests. So Pat and Justin for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get to all your questions again, if you're an insider member, put it in the, in the community and I'll be in there probably in a couple of hours. All the coaches are in there all throughout the week. So we'll get in there and we'll answer your questions next week. We're going to have a couple of folks on to talk about heroes on the water. Um, so it's a perfect, perfect topic to go through at this time of the year. Um, great organization, great cause. And we got two, two guys coming on to talk about that in detail. So until then, guys, if you can do it safely, make sure you get out there, get on the water and get some tight lines.